الله أكبر الله أكبر I was born in India in a village in on the 1st of July 1918 and August 1927 I reached Durban South Africa This is the Madrasa Arcade in Durban, South Africa. The curious narrow alleyways of the Madrasa Arcade are familiar to Yaqub Mehtar. Over 50 years ago, he and his young friend Ahmed would wander through the marketplace on their way to the tailor shop of Ahmed's father, Hussein Didat. And this is the shop of Mr. Didat, Mr. Didat Sr. Nine-year-old Ahmed Didat moved to Durban in 1927 to join his father Hussein, who had settled there a few years earlier. Ahmed's voyage to South Africa had been long and difficult. In fact, he almost never made it to the streets of Durban. Much of the money went to pay for the rent of their small apartment in Ismail building next to one of the oldest mosques in Durban. One of Ahmed's neighbors in the building, Ahmed Suleiman Balim, would eventually become one of his lifelong supporters. Uh, this is the building, and on the right you see this apartment here. Ahmed Didat and his family stayed, uh -huh. and I used to be his neighbor. Next one, which is in apartment number two. You are very close. So we're very close. In fact, nice people, but the family was very poor people. Ahmed enrolled at the Anjuman school where he was in standard four. It was the first time he had seen the letters ABC and heard the words yes and no. In six months time, however, he had learned English and became the top of his class. He was promoted to the next standard where he also excelled academically. Every day he walked to school and back home because his father couldn't afford the bus fare of two pennies. He later moved on to Sastri College, a respectable school built by an Indian immigrant to South Africa. Ahmed showed up for the first day of his new school in his clean new uniform, ready to hit the books. But this is where Ahmed Didat's education came to an abrupt end. He must have spent only a few hours walking these corridors because after only three days at college, his father pulled him out. Financial considerations put an abrupt end to him furthering his education. Then's mission was outside Durban in the rolling hills of rural South Africa. Ahmed took a job in a country store called the O.N. Muhammad shop. Just across the way was the enormous Adams Mission Complex, an institute where young missionaries learned how to convert others to Christianity. As missionaries, you know, they were making life miserable for us from this college. They were getting training there as to how to deal with the Muslims. And as they came to do their shopping here, they asked us questions. Criticism, actually. He says, you know, Muhammad has so many wives. I knew nothing about that. He says, you know, Muhammad spread his religion at the point of the sword. I knew nothing about that. He says, you know, he copied his book from the Jews and the Christians. I knew nothing about that. So what was I as a Muslim to do? I had a natural urge for reading. And one Sunday morning, going into my boss's warehouse, go down, I was rummaging through a pile of old newspapers, looking for some better reading material than newspapers to read. And as I was looking for such a material, I came across a worm-eaten book. This book, we have renewed the cover, but a worm-eaten book. And when I picked it up, when I picked it up, 
I started to sneeze because it was all full of mildew. And I read the title of the book. It said, is Harul Haq. Spelled out in Latin script, I-Z-H-A-R-U-L-H-A-K-K. Is Harul Haq. Now, to me, that sounded Arabic. Is Harul Haq. It sounds like Arabic. So, I didn't know what it meant. I see here, at the bottom, it says, The Truth Revealed. This was a very old publication, printed in 1915 in India. Two years older than myself. I was born in 18. This is three years older than myself. Now, this book actually changed my life. Ahmed Dida now had his armor. His shield would be his extensive knowledge of the Bible and Quran, and his sword would be his frank, piercing style of delivery. In 1940, he took to the stage and began giving lectures to small audiences, the first of which was Muhammad, the Messenger of Peace. I made appointments with them to go to their homes on Sundays, after church, go to church, and talking to them, talking to them. And I talked myself into talking until I came to Durban, reside in Durban. I found a job in Durban. And in Durban, around the 50s, an opening took place. This is also Allah's Musabib al -Asbab. We had a very charismatic speaker coming from overseas. And this speaker, very unusual, for a Sunday morning, he used to get two to two, three hundred people every Sunday morning. And the crowd was increasing continuously. And I used to attend this talk of his, very fascinating. At the end of the talk, question and answers, and when everything was over, after a few months, a revert to Islam, an Englishman who had become Muslim, by the name of Mr. Fairfax. This Mr. Fairfax, he suggested, he said, look, any of you, if you are interested, I am prepared to teach you people comparative religion. But he called it Bible class. He said, I will teach you the Bible, how to use the Bible in propagating Islam. So he said, very good. So uh, out of this two to three hundred audience every Sunday morning that this other gentleman drew, about 15 to 20 opted to remain for a second injection. And this Mr. Fairfax began teaching us that look in the book of Daniels, there are certain prophecies and how to use those prophecies. In the book of Deuteronomy, in the Bible, there are certain prophecies regarding the coming of our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how we can exploit them, how we can expound them. So this thing carried on for a few more weeks or a couple of months and then Mr. Fairfax was absent. And I could see the disappointment on the faces of these young people. We were all young then, uh, 15 to 20 of us. We were looking at each other's faces, disappointed, and we break up. The following Sunday again, we look at each other's faces. Where is Mr. Fairfax? No news. And we break up. The third Sunday, I suggested to them, to the, those people who were enthusiastic about having a um, second inning, I said, look, if you like, I can carry on where Mr. Fairfax left off. Because I had the knowledge that I was sitting in to give this person my moral support. Myself and my secretary, who has just passed away, Mr. G.H.E. Vanker. Now, we were both knowledgeable as far as the Bible was concerned. But we would give them our moral support. We said, we sit there and with the rest. Now I said, look, if you like, I will give you I will carry on from where Mr. Fairfax left off. And if you get bored, tired, fed up, just go on. And there will be notice enough for me to stop. And for three years, I continued talking to them. And I discovered now that that was my best way of learning. Because there is no better way to learn than to teach. As our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, بَلِّغُ anni وَلَوْ aya." Deliver the message regarding me, even if it is one verse. That's a secret. If you have one verse, and if you share, and you share, and you share, then Allah fills you up with more. I didn't know that then, but I can now realize what was happening. Teaching them, teaching them. Then I had some visitors. Visitors, visitors used to come along. There were some visitors coming from Johannesburg, and they stayed in for my class. And 
and they feel that they can exploit my talents. So they said, look, we are having a birthday celebration of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi in the city hall of Johannesburg, and we would like you to come and speak to us. So I said, I'm a working class man, I can't afford these trips, but if you give me an A ticket, I will come. So they gave me an A return A ticket, and for the first time in my life, I traveled by A to read Johannesburg and deliver the lecture. Now that gave me an idea. But if I can lecture in the city hall of Johannesburg, what is wrong with the city hall of Durban? So we organized a lecture here in the city hall of Durban. And it, it was in 1958, December 1958. And as a result of that, two Caucasians, white people, Europeans, they started visiting our offices in Madras Arcade. And subsequently, uh, con con twice, a certain type of conversion took place that we converted to those two white gentlemen who were coming to my office, we converted them in the West Street Mosque here in Durban, and then another two within a week, an Indian and, and, and uh, a European again in the Juma Masjid, Durban. So there was somebody watching. Allah watches all times. But there was somebody else who was witnessing uh, our work, an elderly gentleman, by the name of Haji S.I. Kadwa. So after the second conversion of people in the Juma Masjid, the man, while he's tying his shoelaces, I'm also on the same bench tying my shoelaces, he's telling me that he had observed my work, what I had been doing, and he likes it very much. And he said, look, I've got 75 acres of land at a place called Brahma in Natal about 55 miles outside Durban, and I'm prepared to give it to you. So I said, I accept. He said, no, not so fast. You must first have a look at the place. I said, what is there to look? So he said, no, no, you must first have a look. I was thinking that if there are 50 acres of rocks, I will still have 25 acres of good land. If there are 25 acres of rocks, I'll have 50 acres of good land. And Natal is a garden colony. This colony is called a garden colony with all this greenery and beauty and natural other qualities about it. So he said, no, you must have a look. So I with the, our trustees, we, I went down and I saw the land and I accepted it and I started establishing an institution called As Salam, where I could train Muslim missionaries. It is functioning at the moment. Ahmed and his family uprooted from Durban and moved 80 kilometers south to the uninhabited hills surrounding As Salam. He had to chop down trees just to reach the land. Once he arrived, he immediately put his hand to the plow in establishing the institution. But Ahmed was devoted to spreading Islam in the best way he knew how, by speaking. His wife, Hawa, was at first shocked to see her husband doing so well up on the stage. I thought, can this man talk? <laughs> but his talks gained in popularity until eventually he found himself here at the town hall in Durban. He now had a full house of around 2,000 people. Didat's lectures here were some of the few events in which segregation briefly disappeared. His message was that there were many contradictions in the Christian Bible and doctrine and that Muhammad was indeed a noble messenger sent by God. Ahmed's preaching began to take over his life. He moved to apartment number 45, Hussein Building, where he put in countless hours of planning as well as budgeting. We had been doing a certain type of work in that we were using the Juma Masjid Durban for attracting visitors. So we started advertising the Juma Masjid Durban in the Durban Corporation brochure, they give out to visitors, tourists, we saying that visit the largest mosque in the Southern Hemisphere for a free guided tour phone, 27054. That was a very old, old number. And people used to phone and they used to come. Because generally to the tourist, they didn't know the difference between a mosque and a temple. To them now, these are synonymous terms. So they came and we explained we explain to them what goes on, we gave them free literature, and this was one of our major works that we were doing, giving out literature and explaining Islam. If I were to tell you, he said, look, what is the name of the God that you worship? And if I said Muhammad, for example, if I said Muhammad, immediately you think of a camel driver born in Mecca, 
some 600 years after Jesus, right? And if you know his history, so yes, his father's name was Abdullah, his mother's name was Amina, and he was born in Makkah, he died in Medina, he's buried there, so you have a mental picture. So as soon as you have a mental picture, it's rejected in Islam. You can't have any name which creates a mental picture. We Muslims, we say that call God Almighty by any name. Call him by any name, as long as that name is not contaminated. And holding lecture meetings throughout the country on different topics where we can enthuse the Muslim with regards to propagation. So strengthen them against the Christian missionary activity and put them in a, in a position that they can talk back and explain Islam. Meanwhile, his popularity was growing nationwide. He was invited to Cape Town, where he received an overwhelming response. In Cape Town, he lectured in huge lecture halls, including the Good Hope Center and City Hall. To them, Ahmed Didad was a knight in shining armor who had come to liberate them from the pressures of hardline missionaries and the idea that Islam was not a credible religion. But along with his momentum came the demand for a professional organization which could manage the size of planning and the money he needed to continue. And so in 1957, Ahmed Didat, alongside two of his closest friends, founded the Islamic Propagation Center in Durban. The organization's first base was a tiny one-room office in the Madrasa Arcade. The three founders started recruiting staff, one of whom was a secretary by the name of Muhammad Khan. So he said, join me. Join us, Mr. Veronica and Mr. Didata, they wanted to type us. I'm a top typist. After London, he was swept up in a whirlwind of tours. Crucified. This liberated Palestinian, now a citizen of the United States, well spoken and immaculately dressed, was easily mistaken for a Pakistani. Now, listen to his well articulated English and still more eloquent Arabic at question time and Mr. Didat's reply. I would like to say that I am grateful for this opportunity and my questions are actually two. Number one, if the Quran is indeed from God, does it contradict itself in as much as it says, okay. Therefore, Jesus was born, he died and he rose again. The second question. Mr. Didat. Thank you. The verse in question is Assalamu alayya yawma wulidtu wa yawma amutu wa yawma ubasu hayya This translated means So peace is on me the day that I was born the day that I die and the day that I shall be raised to life again the day that I die it is not the day that I died it's not died, it's in the future Mr. Dida we have invited you to our Christian nation to debate the topic, is the Bible the Word of God? Will you now show the courage to invite Reverend Swaggart to debate you once again on the same topic in the city of Mecca? And if not, why? Mecca. You see, if the questioner had asked, are you prepared to debate Brother Swaggart in the United States, in the different cities. I said, I'm prepared now to offer $10,000 for each meeting in places like the Madison Square Garden in New York, venues of that kind, $10,000 per meeting, four meetings in the United States, $40,000. But the questioner is asking whether I would be prepared to invite him to Mecca. Now, I don't rule Mecca, number one. Number two, if you want to get into Mecca, you need a visa. There is a condition attached to you visiting Mecca. And that condition is that you declare with your lips, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. <laughs> the meaning is, the meaning is that I believe that there is but one God, not Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Not Jesus, that God. I believe in the one and only God, Allah, which is His name. 
and that Muhammad is the last and final messenger of God. You feel that condition, you are welcome to come to Mecca. I have here a poison. Can you please, can you please testify for the audience that you have the true faith in Jesus? <laughs> I'm telling you what I'm going to do. I, I'm shaking a little bit. Excuse me, but listen now. You see, you asked me if I believe in Jesus, and I want to tell you. I believe in Jesus as it is written in the Gospels. I don't believe in Jesus as it is written in the Quran. I'm asking him, I'm asking him, if you want to kill me, I must have five minutes more. I'm grateful to God Almighty for sparing this old machine to be able to come across the Indian Ocean into a country which my people call down under. That's, I know, that's what you said, down under. The country down under. You know, on the globe of the world, you said, this is the country which is down under. So I, I don't know how you people manage to remain here, I don't know. <laughs> In Europe, they used to say, see Venus and die. Meaning, that's the acme, the greatest thing that you can see is Venus. You know, the city on the waters, the waterways, it's Venice. In Italy, I think it is. Venice. Venice. So see, Venice and die. Now I can go back to my country and tell my people, see Sydney and die. <laughs> no, no. We started with advertising the Quran in our local New Sunday newspapers, one called the Sunday Tribune. We advertise Quranic verses under the heading, The Quran Speaks. A message from the Quran. And giving our name and address that further inquiries can be made and for free literature they can write. And then the same thing we started doing for the African people in the Zulu language newspaper called Ilang Alasi Natal, mean the son of Natal in which we had Ikuran Yakuluma, which means what the Quran says. And again, the same technique, verses from the Quran translated into Zulu and offering people free information and, and uh, literature. In buildings you'll find the sign saying, read Al-Quran, the last testament. Read Al-Quran, the last testament. During the day, the sign is there, and at night, it flashes, you know, the color, so in other words, attracting people's attention. We have so far handled this office of mine, some 85,000 Holy Quran translations, Arabic text, translation and commentary, which we have been selling, and what returns we get, gets plowed back into propagation. I want to help the people in Sri Lanka, and in India, Pakistan, in the UK, we want to do this, that the Quran is made available. We are reproducing videotapes of our lectures, mostly on comparative basis. Like this particular one, it says, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi in the Bible, in resp response to Swagat. Whole world is crying for these tapes, because it's something novel to them. It's, it's really a novel thing because they have heard lectures about only addressing Muslims, how to make salat, we must give zakat, we must not drink, we must not gamble, you know, we must be attired Islamically and all that. They have been listening to that continuously for centuries now, for decades. But now comes along something novel in, in a, most especially people in a Western environment, like in the United States or in any other country where Muslims are, where the Christian missionaries are making onslaughts like in India and in Pakistan and in Bangladesh and in Indonesia wherever the Muslims are we find that they are under attack and they don't know how to respond they don't know how to respond to these Christian missionaries so our tapes are doing the job so there is a demand all over the world so the department is expanding and increasing so we have now exploited the machines these electronic wizards by creating what we call Islamic telecoms. We have two uh, in Durban at the present moment. 
one in our own building here, two of our shops, you know, we took them over, shops in the building, and we changed them into Islamic telecoms. What happens there is that in the window, we have a monitor that at least 16 hours a day, our programs are being played, passers by are being attracted. Then inside, we have seating accommodation that the people can come and sit inside, watch the monitor inside, in comfort. We have now started training da'is, people who can go and propagate Islam. Because the Muslims all over the world, where I go and lecture, they seem to have taken a liking to my approach. Because something that was lacking in, that the Muslim didn't know how to approach the non-Muslim, the Jews, the Christians, the Hindus, and I'm showing them how it can be done. To me, it's just a very natural thing to do, which Allah gives us a secret in the Holy Quran when He says, Qul, tell them, Ya Ahl al Kitab, O people of the book, O Jews and Christians, Ta'ala, come. Ila kalimatin sawa'im baynana wa baynakum. That we come to common terms as between us and you. Let us get onto a common platform. Some understanding us about basics. And then Allah tells us what to talk about. But now we have not been doing that because we didn't know how. Allah is telling you on a common platform, talk about this. Allah na'bud illallah wa la nushrika bihi shay'an wa la yattakhiza ba'duna ba'dan arbaba min dunillah. One of the most memorable visitors here was the head of a Catholic church body, Mr. Dawood Ngwane. I was looking for a particular book in my son's bedroom. There's a pile of old books in my son's bedroom. I was looking for a book that I wanted to use. And um, <clears throat> while looking for this little the, this book, I found this little booklet. And the, 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 uh, the title attracted my attention. Crucifixion or crucifixion? I thought, what, is, what does it mean? So that day I read the booklet three times. I tell you that I couldn't put the book down during my supper time. That day, Mr. Nguani's world was turned upside down. At the age of 63, he began a new life as a Muslim. But he was never able to have another conversation with Ahmed Didat at the IPCI. The vibrant, dynamic orator was violently catapulted into a body which no longer worked. He suffered a stroke which left him completely paralyzed from the neck down. Unfortunately, most members of Providence would have it. On the 3rd of May 1996, Sheikh Ahmed Didat was struck by stroke whilst on duty and became incapacitated, being unable to move any limbs, unable to speak, and un unable to eat. However, Providence in its mercy retained Sheikh Didat's hearing, eyesight, and ever sharp and alert mind. Sheikh Didat communicates with a unique combination of eye movements, identifying the English alphabets. For the past six years or so, Sheikh Didat is now confined to his bed in Verlum but still influencing and changing the hearts of people all over the world with the legacy of his books, videotapes and infrastructure that he left behind at the IPCI. Despite his handicap, Sheikh Didat has dedicated and dictated many books from his bed via the eye communication method. However, it can be said with humility that no other South African or perhaps no other sick person has had so many visitors from all over the world ranging from government ministers, TV crews, from major international networks, religious leaders of all religious groups, academics, scholars, and ordinary people. In this snippet, we see Minister Louis Farah Khan from America paying a visit to Sheikh Ahmad Didat at his home with his entourage on his recent visit to South Africa. Africa. And last time, I had the privilege of going to the one of my heroes. Who is that? Ahmed Didat, one of the great champions of Islam. He's a hero of mine. We have shared many days together. He visited me in my home in Chicago, Illinois, and I visited him here and 
saw him in the days of his strength. And last night, I saw him even stronger. His brain is sharp. He can see, he can hear, he can think, he just can't speak. But his faith is so strong. I came from his bedside so inspired, so uplifted. And I said, Father, when I go back, I will carry on your great work. One of the core programs of the IPCI is what we call human resource development, training of individuals to meet the challenges and the new challenges facing us globally, nationally, and internationally. Here we see a, the last July group of students from all over the country who have come in for a one week intensive training program that was run at As Salam Institute. These are uh, the Duat from all over the country, some as far afield as Botswana, Lesotho, Zambia, and the nine provinces. One of his most memorable visits was when a familiar face showed up and greeted him, this time as a Muslim. When I decided that I'm going to become a Muslim, I woke up, up in the morning and I told my wife that I'm going to convert to, to become a Muslim. And I went to the IPCI to go and see you, to tell you. I thought I was going to break the good news to you. And on that day, when I came at the IPCI, they told me, you, you know, you, you were sick and you, had been, you were paralyzed. On that day. Today, they watched the video of that first day when Dawood walked into Ahmed's office demanding answers. It's strange for both of them to look back on that day now. Each man lived a completely different life back then. And six years ago, he suffered a stroke which was known as a lock-in syndrome. Lock-in syndrome is that my father can hear, understand, feel everything. But it is difficult for him to communicate. The only food which enters Ahmed Dida's body today is a liquid nutrient called Novocol. He is fed through a rubber tube which goes directly into his stomach. The stomach acids are so strong that the tube has to be changed once a month. And the doctor that changes the tube is an 80 years old angel that changes the tube. No doctor has come here to attend to my father. She is the doctor and she is the mother. Mrs. Didat, with hardly any formal education, tends to her husband's needs as if she were one of the world's top physicians. She took charge shortly after Ahmed was flown to Saudi Arabia for special medical attention. She learned from the nurses in Riyadh and helped them as they did their work routine. He walked with a grace that belied his size. This powerful man with a glint in his eyes. In the ring, a study of purpose and skill, a triumph of talent and training and will. A master of arts and the art of defense, a master of building a spell of suspense. Outside of the ring, away from the crowd, a soft-spoken man, part humble, part proud. Fear was the enemy each time to face and fear the opponent he kept in his place. His courage was tested again and again by those who were deemed to be men amongst men. The worthy opponents who fought toe to toe, who gave not an inch as they trade, blow for blow. He met them, he fought them, and then he'd collect <laughs> that treasure of treasures, the gift of respect. The word and the deed soon became intertwined, the mouth and the, the fist, the body and the mind, the legend and fact, the image, the truth, the wisdom of age and the sparkle of youth were spread on a canvas for all to behold, a 
power of steel meets the glitter of gold. Champion! Thank Allah. Thank God. Touch the hearts of our listeners, both young and old. Sometimes you made us laugh, and sometimes you made us cry. But your message was always clear. Do Dawa. Although you will not be on the air, you will still be on the lips of all those who listen to your lectures during the past two months. Some say you are too hard in your method, but ask those who came in from darkness into the light of Islam. You were armed with a pen, yet you took the world by storm. You gained, you gained the respect of the Middle East, and you earned your heavyweight crown when you took on America's giant, Jimmy Swaggart. You were the king of the stage, the best of the best, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Enough, Mustadi Dad. You have done your best. Now, as you rest, your videos and books speak for you. We salute you, Sheikh Didat. We honor you, Sheikh Didat. We love you, Sheikh Didat. Jazakallah. Ya Shaykhi, Ya Imami, Shaykh al-Islam wa Ahmad Didat, fa innaka khayr al-nas anta al-mubariz, li'ila idin al-lay anta al-majiz, fa innaka aschan In the meantime, his legacy is already moving in the lives of others, and the IPCI is busy keeping pace with public requests. 
It receives scores of phone calls, letters, emails and faxes each day. We are so well known here that even if the people don't write our address, they just write Sheikh Ahmadida Durban or IPCI Durban, it has to reach us. The current trustees of IPCI are Mr. Ahmed Said Mullah, who is the Amir, Mr. Tahir Sitoto, an academic at Natal University, Mr. Yusuf Ali, Dr. Khatija Molloy, who is an academic at Rao uh, uh, University, Mr. Ibrahim Jadwat, Mr. Dawood Ngwane, the attorney, Dr. Muhammad Khan, Mr. Harun Kala, Mr. Akhtar Token, and Mr. Anwar Bellum. Direc the director of the IPCI is Mr. Rafiq Hassan. The new trustees over the past six years have indeed kept the legacy of its founder, Sheikh Ahmad Didat, alive and have also unanimously voted him as patron of IPCI for life. However, many sweeping changes, politically and otherwise, have taken place both in South Africa and globally, changes that brought into play new scenarios and new demographics. The IPCI had to meet these new challenges. One of its intervention measures was to bring in international guest speakers. Over the past few years, the IPCI brought the following dynamic personalities to our shores. Dr. Ali Musa from America, a previous drug lord turned social reformer. Dr. Khalid Al-Mansur, an academic from America. Dr. Deborah Mubashir, a former Baptist minister from America. Mr. John Yahya Kaysen, also from America, father of the boxer Hasim Rahman. Our current MC, Dr. Don Matera, is our own international personality in his own right, who ran a workshop on African Renaissance. Then came September 11th, which changed again in a very profound way the world we live in. To meet these challenges, we had as guests of IPCI, Dr. Zafar Bangash of Canada and Dr. Enver Masood from Washington, D.C., who gave us some insight into the happenings of September 11th. IPCI also has embarked on making available relevant books to counteract the false propaganda and at times blatant lies that are being splashed on our print and electronic media. Dr. Enver Masood's book entitled War on Islam, which covers world events since the 1991 U.S. invasion of Iraq, details the news behind the news, things which we do not read in the papers. Publish It or Not is another book that has been produced and published by IPCI. It is written by two British journalists who are not Muslims, who wrote this book which exposes the human right atrocities perpetrated by the State of Israel against innocent men, women and children in Palestine, when all the established print media refused to publish the facts. The book written in Zulu by IPCI trustee Mr. Daoud Ngwane. We have a few more books in the pipeline to be published. Alhamdulillah, the IPCI, with the help of the Ministry of Qatar, have printed 5,000 copies each of Sheikh Dida's very popular books Muhammad in the Bible, The Muslim at Prayer. These books were out of stock for many years due to lack of funding. In addition to this, 5,000 each of Ingi Muslim and Ubatka, which are books in the local Zulu language, have also been printed to meet the Dawa demands of the indigenous Zulu-speaking people. The IPCI is looking for sponsors to translate and print its very popular books and booklets into some of the other major local languages, example Kroza and Sutu, as many requests are being received. Alhamdulillah, again, due to the help of a local businessman, Soligur, 10,000 copies each of some pamphlets which are out of stock for many years have been printed. My Mother, My Mother, Fire in Your Bellies, What is Islam, which is a new publication, Alcohol, the effects of alcohol in uh, Afrikaans and in Zulu and in English. The IPCI still receives hundreds of requests for its free literature and purchase of its many books, Qurans, DVDs, videotapes, etc., from all over the world, 
from China in the East to USA to Russia to Africa to Europe. The IPCI also receives hundreds of requests for free literature weekly from the many prisons nationally and internationally. In this snippet, we see a letter from a prisoner in New York who says he read Sheikh Didat's one booklet and Alhamdulillah has embraced Islam and he sends one US dollar in appreciation. Alhamdulillah, many such letters are received weekly at the IPCI and our postage bill runs into thousands of rands monthly. Again, with the help of Magdum Foundation and a local businessman who wants to remain anonymous, 43,000 copies of the Yusuf Ali simple English only Quran which we call the Dawa Quran has been printed. This unique Quran answers the misconceptions about Islam in its introduction and has a section on the principles of Islam in Hindu, Jewish and Christian scriptures. This Quran is ideal for da'wah purposes, to, for schools, to put into libraries, hotels, and it is also a must in every Muslim home for only 20 rand. Alhamdulillah, the IPCI also has got its info center which is still running at the ground floor of the IPCI building. At the info center, videos are shown daily, uh, free literature is given out daily, and many people are attracted to Islam and are welcome to visit the information center either to watch a video or to see the free literature or browse to the books or the DVDs that we have for sale. The IPCI is also kept abreast with trends and have now all of Sheikh Didat's as well as many other international speakers, lectures and debates in DVD format. Many new titles have also been produced. The New World Order and the Life and Times of Sheikh Didat, a special edition which is only available from the IPCI. We also have a DVD which on a tribute paid to Sheikh Didat at the Durban City Hall. The IPCI has continued the legacy of Sheikh Didat in terms of the masjid tours. Alhamdulillah, for the first part of this year alone, 660 masjid tours have been conducted by the IPCI free of charge. Durban being a popular international tourist destination attracts many visitors from all over the world and the IPCI is listed on the uh, tourism boards listing for guided tours of the Juma Masjid which is the largest mosque in the southern hemisphere. The IPCI also conducts special tours for special groups as part of its Dawa outreach program to make Islam to be better understood in our times. In this snippet, one sees Christian priests from all over Africa in dialogue with us at the IPCI. In this next snippet, we see a group of university students from America as guests of the IPCI who belong to an organization called People to People. In all these instances, they are taken for a free guided tour of the masjid, brought back to the IPCI lecture room for dialogue and refreshments and meals served. The IPCI is also doing extensive free excursion packages for non-Muslim schools. The students are taken for a guided tour of the masjid, taken to our Abdul Aziz auditorium, where they are shown a 15-minute documentary on the big screen on understanding Islam. Then follows a question and answer session. And finally, the students are given free literature and snacks. For this year alone, for the first part of the year, over 25 such school visits and excursions have been conducted from schools from afar afield as Swaziland and Johannesburg and Durban and surrounding area. The establishment of the IPCI Learning Academy has been one of the landmark projects of the IPCI in recent times. Many different classes and courses are held on a daily and weekly basis. A two-month full-time course in comparative religion has seen students coming from all the nine provinces of South Africa, from Southern Africa, from Africa, states like Namibia, Botswana, Malawi, Zambia, Sudan, Zimbabwe, as well as Saudi Arabia, Dubai, the United Kingdom, America, and Pakistan. Alhamdulillah, to date, 41 such 
the students have graduated from the IPCI Comparative Religion course for the, uh, from the time of its inception. Daily classes for new Muslims and reverts are also conducted at the IPCI, where they are taught the basics of Islam, Tahara, Wazu, how to perform Salah, and basic Arabic. To integrate the new Muslims, a revert forum has also been established at the IPCI for the first time. This forum meets regularly where the new Muslims interact socially. They act as a support group for the unique problems facing the new Muslims. Introduction to journalism course is also offered every Saturday mornings by qualified journalists in the field. This course equips the Da'i and those interested to respond to the sometimes hostile media that we find ourselves in. Since the course started, 52 students have graduated from this journalism course. The IPCI also offers adult literacy classes to those who cannot read and write English. This course is open to non-Muslims as well who are taught the basic skills of adult literacy of reading and writing. Public talks, dialogues have also been continued. In this snippet, we see the current director giving a lecture to a mixed audience on the topic of Is Jesus a Miracle Healer? The lecture tour was run in many community halls in and around Durban. This is where people are actually lacking spiritual knowledge of who is the healer divine. The healer divine is God himself. Thank you. Uh, this is the kind of discussion we'd like to encourage. We see we, in, from the Islamic point of view, if we can get everybody to accept, and as, if I take it, the last gentleman, he, he's been to service and he's also uh, active in the church, is that if we can come to an agreement that God is healing, not Jesus, peace be upon him, not the, anybody, but God ultimately is the one who heals. And as we say in the Quran, we have, right our, like the Christians have the Lord's Prayer, we have our opening prayer and the first page of the Quran. Open this Quran here and you open the first page. It's called the opening, the chapter 1, which is Surah Fatiha. We say, In here we say to God, You alone we worship and you alone we ask for help. See, so this is, this is the important principle we want to, to lay down. Other series of published talks was held in similar venues for non-Muslim audiences on the topic of Muhammad in Hindu, Jewish and Christian scriptures. In all these public talks, questions and comments were allowed from the public. Apart from this, the IPCI is often invited to many interfaith dialogue forums, university programs, government programs to give an Islamic viewpoint on many issues. Alhamdulillah, Due to these dawah efforts and the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and its donors, reversions have increased at the IPCI with people from all walks of life and all stratas of society and all religions embracing Islam. Alhamdulillah, for up to the first six months of this year, 61 people have embraced Islam, mainly from Hindu and Christian backgrounds, from the different racial groups and the different sexes that we find in the mosaic and cosmopolitan community of South Africa. Despite the global onslaught against Islam, paradoxically and against all reason, Islam is still the fastest growing religion in South Africa and the world, alhamdulillah. With your continued support, we can meet the challenge of da'wah facing us, inshallah. In conclusion, we ask you to make dua for the IPCI's founder, Marhum Sheikh Ahmad Didat. May Allah grant him the highest abode in Jannah for the legacy he left behind and help us at the IPCI to continue the work and support us and make dua for us at the IPCI that we continue to fulfill the legacy of Sheikh Didat and the cause of Islam. May Allah reward you all. Inshallah. Amin.